Hi, I'm Beth Holly, and I'm here to talk about how I found my place in the, the legal profession. I graduated law school in 1988. It was a time of big hair and big shoulder pads. Women's fashion required us to wear suits with skirts and stockings, high heels, and these dreadful floppy bows called pussy bows. Not our best moment. And men really dominated the profession. Even though 50% of my graduating class from law school was women, when I got to a law firm, I quickly saw that most, if not all, of the partners in the firm were men. And the culture was definitely geared towards men. And there were several um, incidents that happened during my time at a law firm that really showed me for the first time that my gender could actually be an impediment in this profession. For example, I, I attended a client meeting um, in a boardroom at a law firm. Um, and it was this beautiful big boardroom at the top floor of the building. And at some point I needed to use the restroom. Well, there was no ladies restroom on that floor. In fact, I had to walk down a back staircase to the secretary's bathroom on another floor. This was in the late 1980s. I had a, a female colleague of mine who attended a closing dinner for a big deal that she had been working on. And when she got to the location of the event was told that the, the, the um, place didn't admit women. And so she was asked to leave. And no partner stood up and said, no, 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 well then we'll go somewhere else or insist that she stay. She just left. And even at my own firm, when it came time for the holiday party, my invitation was addressed to Mr. and Mrs. with my husband's full name. I never got the invitation because the mailroom didn't know where to send it. There was no one by that name at the firm. And things only got worse after I had my first child. You know, being a successful litigator at the firm and billing a lot of hours, which was incompatible with the kind of parent that I wanted to be. And in fact, the, law, the firm offered a mommy track option for women who wanted to work part time. And it's astonishing to me that without any hesitation, the, the deal that they offered women was to work four days a week for three fifths pay. You know, we talk about pay equity now and just imagine being expressly told we're gonna ask you to work four out of five days, but we're only gonna pay you for three. Certainly that was not a deal I was willing to take. And so it was around that time that I began to explore other options. Because the law firm, the things that the law firm valued weren't necessarily what I valued. The law, law firm valued hard work, which I'm all for, really long hours, because it was all about the billable hours. And it really was about this kind of boys club camaraderie that I didn't feel a part of. And what was lacking from law firm values was leadership. And leadership was something I was very interested in. And so I decided to look for an in-house role, being in-house counsel to a company where I might be able to have more control over my schedule and might find a role that allowed me to bring my whole self into the job in an environment that valued what I valued. So I landed at Pfizer. Um, at the time, I didn't know anything about the company. I didn't know anything about healthcare law. I learned it on the job. And I was fortunate to have as my boss, someone who became my mentor, who told me early on, took me aside and said, Beth, you need to understand that you're not in the law business anymore. You're in the pharmaceutical business. And that really signaled an important mind shift that proved to be fundamental to the way I've become a lawyer ever since that time. Because being an in-house lawyer means really understanding the business that you're in and being able to partner with your client, who is your company, on achieving their business objectives. And that's something that outside lawyers don't often do because they are not as embedded in the business that they are supporting. The other thing that the in-house role offered me was this opportunity for leadership. Pfizer was excellent in developing really strong leaders and invested in leadership training for people that they felt had potential. 
And it was at that company that I first learned how to be a leader and learned that I love leading other people. I spent 13 years at that company and then left and have now spent 12 years at Regeneron. And if you're familiar with both of those names in the COVID space, it is something that is very gratifying to me to have been a part of two companies that have been so important in the current COVID battle that we're under, that we are waging right now. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But I love being an in-house lawyer. And it requires a different skill set than that than outside counsel requires. You know, for outside counsel, your job is really to be an expert on the law, to, 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 to turn, turn over every leaf to find the argument or the case law or the language for a deal that meets your client's needs. You are asked to be, to be deep, have deep knowledge and expertise and to advise your client on what the law says and what their options might be. But being an in-house lawyer is a little bit different. As I mentioned, you really have to have a business mindset. You have to invest the time and energy to fully understand your business. You have to have the ability to think on your feet because you, unlike being in a law firm, you won't have the time to go off to the library to do a lot of research or ask an associate to write you a memo on a topic. You're gonna to need to make judgment calls in the moment, which means using common sense and your past experience, being creative in finding solutions to problems and challenges, being agile and being able to shift from one issue to another. I, my my uh, responsibilities span half a dozen different subject areas of the law. So there's always something new that you need to be adapting to. You have to know how to deal with ambiguity because it's an ever shifting landscape and you don't always know exactly where things are going to land, what the facts are, where they're going to be, what, what decisions the business is gonna make that you're going to need to adapt to. And you have to really have a drive to get things done, to deliver results. We don't sit back and, and advise somebody else and let them make the decision. We're involved in the decisions. Now I'm chief compliance officer at Regeneron, which means I'm responsible for our ethics and compliance program. So integrity is key to what we do. And, and integrity is critically important in the research that we do, in the manufacturing that we do, in the business that as it operates, integrity is just integral to that effort. So being a part of that and drawing on my own personal integrity has been a big part of how I operate as an in-house lawyer. And finally, just talking about leadership, because I've mentioned that a couple of times. You know, when, when you are um, in an in-house environment, as I mentioned, leaders get rewarded, people get rewarded by with leadership responsibilities, and you get a chance to um, convey your knowledge and your understanding to the next generation of leaders. And I have found that that has been a very rewarding part of the way I operate as a lawyer in my jobs. So the, the opportunity that you have as an in-house lawyer to marry your legal knowledge, your business knowledge, your personal, um, your personal strengths, for me, integrity, creativity, um, commitment to getting things done, with the ability to lead others in the same fashion is a privileged space that I have been really very fortunate um, to have landed on as a way of being a lawyer. And, and both Pfizer and Regeneron gave me the opportunity to hone these skills, which really prepared me for 2020. Because when 2020 hits and COVID-19 comes onto the horizon, um, all of those skills needed to be brought to bear. Regeneron was, um, played a key role um, in trying to find a treatment for COVID-19. Um, this was something that Regeneron was ready to do. We had um, been investing in our research uh, uh, technologies for many, many years. And just a few years ago, we're critical in finding a cure for the Ebola virus by devising an antibody cocktail that that married two different antibodies to be able to treat that infectious disease. And so when we first learned about the coronavirus pandemic that was beginning in China in early 2020, our research teams immediately took the skills that they learned in fighting Ebola to try to fight and find a cure for COVID-19. 
And as they were doing that and operating with a great sense of urgency, that's when I first was able to really leverage the deep knowledge of the business that I had previously invested it in, invested in, because that allowed us to move quickly, to address any legal issues in real time. And one of the things that I've done over the course of my career, which is really important for an in-house role, is building relationships of trust with your business partners. And to establish yourself, not as a roadblock to their success, but actually as a business enabler, because that gives us a seat at the table where the decisions are being made in real time and gives us the opportunity then to really add value by identifying potential roadblocks and finding ways to eliminate it eliminate them, to find new paths that might be new ways to use the law to our advantage that might be helpful in achieving the business objective. And in this case, of really having a direct impact on a global pandemic. And those skills that I talked about, collaboration, agility, came into, um, into high demand. So for instance, even while our research efforts were focused on trying to find a cure for COVID-19, the rest of our business was still going on. We were doing clinical trials in a whole, for a whole range of new products. And we needed to figure out how do we adapt those clinical trials for the fact that people are, are in lockdown? How do we continue to monitor them for safety without traveling to clinical sites around the world to uh, observe things in real time? And the same token, for our commercial organization, we have several products that are approved and we have a field force of sales representatives across the United States who routinely go into doctor's offices to talk to them about the products while well, they were suddenly going to be locked down as well and doing that from their homes. So we had to quickly adapt our compliance policies and our practices to enable virtual engagement. And at the same time, we're really dealing with ambiguity because we are in a new area of law. You, know, you may have heard the term emergency use authorization, which is the regulatory mechanism by which both the vaccines that Pfizer um, and other companies have developed and the treatment that Regeneron has developed, how those are being made available to people. It's not a full um, FDA approval, but an emergency use authorization for use in a pandemic. This had never been used for drugs before. Um, and certainly I had never had any experience with it. So part of it is quickly figuring out what is an EUA? How do we get one? If we get one, what does that mean? How can we operate? We're diving in and the lawyers were critical to that effort. And then I talked a little bit about the drive to get things done. And that was really important because myself and my team, we were already working at 110% before this started. And now I needed to bring on another 110% of work um, on top of that. So how do we marshal all of our resources and have the stamina to deliver on emerging issues while still maintaining um, the support necessary for existing activities? And so in, as, we, as we are um, doing all these things so quickly, we can't lose our focus on integrity. Because to, to put a product out in the marketplace, particularly one that hasn't had the benefit of a full FDA approval, people need to trust. And people can only trust when they know that the company behind that is trustworthy, is being transparent about um, their information, is maintaining a focus on quality and compliance and integrity while doing this as quickly as we could. And as chief compliance officer, that was part of my role was ensuring that while we moved as quickly as we could, we were not cutting corners. And then the last part about, about this that I want to talk about is that, you know, in mid-March of last year, suddenly I was no notice, my entire team of 40 people were told, pack up what you can, go home, don't know how long you're going to be working from home. And of course, we still don't know, it's been over a year now. And so as a, this is where my leadership skills were really really brought to the fore because I needed to somehow become the glue that held this group together while we were physically apart. And emotional leadership became a really big part of that. It was really necessary to understand the challenges that people were facing. Some who had family members who were struck ill by COVID-19, even people who were at a great distance. Others who were quickly trying to figure out how do they um, manage schooling for their children who are now going to be having school at home, or those who had 
children who weren't school age and don't have childcare anymore? How do we support them, these people, to deal with the stresses of these new arrangements? So I started having biweekly meetings with my team that were really not about business matters so much as they were about human matters. Like how do we support each other through this? And we did some really fun and creative things. You know, we started having these biweekly meetings where we would have a photo challenges, a face, back, face mask challenge where I had everybody send me a picture in their favorite face mask or a, a pet <laughs> pandemic pet parade where people who had gotten pets um, during the pandemic were sharing pictures of them, things like that. And then we did, we brought in a magician that did a magic show one day and a trivia game, another. And while these things seemed light and fun, they proved to be really critical in making people feel connected and cared for. And that in turn enabled them to continue giving to support the growing business need. And the other part that really emerged during this was the importance of authenticity in leadership. And I have always been a fairly transparent person and I share a lot of information about myself. Um, everybody I work with knows the names of my kids and what they're doing and my dogs. And um, I like to bring all of those parts of me into the workplace. And I wanna welcome other people to do the same, to make sure that they feel safe and able to, to bring those parts of themselves into their professional life. And so last summer when the, um, after George Floyd was tragically murdered um, and there was an uprising, a much needed uprising on um, equal justice issues, I chose to talk about that quite directly with my team. Um, and, and, and I got deeply involved in our diversity, equity and inclusion issues um, at Regeneron. Letting people know that I cared about these things went a long way to making them feel safe and secure and connected and, and frankly valued. And you know, oftentimes people think about leadership as soft skills, you know, that you've got your core hard skills, your, you know, your business skills, your legal skills, and then those soft skills. But the, the so-called soft skills are not soft. They're, they can be difficult to acquire and they are incredibly important. And for me, being able to integrate the who I am and the how I show up in the world with the things that I know and the skills that I have is how I bring my whole self into the workplace. So when I think back on what this year has been like and, and, and in fact, what my career has been like because I've now been at this for, um, for over 30 years, there's a few kind of key takeaway lessons that I wanna share with you. One is that there are lots of ways to be a lawyer and I'm sure lots of ways to be all kinds of other professionals that, that, you know, in fields that you may be interested in. And the key to me is finding the path that serves all parts of you, a place where you can be the professional that you want to be, the parent, the partner, all, all of those parts of you need to be served and finding a role that allows you to, to support and express all of those dimensions of yourself is really important. And I also learned that in my role, the more that I show my authentic self in the workplace, the more effective I am and the more successful I am at inspiring others to greater heights. And I realized that the, my strengths of, as a woman have been key to my success. Things like empathy and authenticity, compassion, and frankly, the overall ability to get stuff done. You know, we don't need to hide these so-called feminine qualities to be successful. In fact, it's my belief that the more we integrate the personal and professional dimensions of ourselves, the more effective that we are. So as I leave you here today, I'll leave you one parting wish, which is that you too find an opportunity for yourself that allows you to bring all of yourself to your profession, because we are not one dimensional beings. And we, if you can find a place that welcomes all of your dimensions, I'm sure that you will have both personal and professional success. Thank you.